We're going to worship our Jesus. We'd love if you sing along with us. This song is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Um, it just seems appropriate for me to ask you to stand for this song. Um, if you have a bad knee or something or you just need to take a seat, that's fine too. It's more about the posture of your heart than your actual physical posture. But let's stand up for Jesus. Let's sing it together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ his Lord in Stand up for Jesus, stand in his strength alone. The arm of flesh will bear you, we dare not trust no more. Put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with dread. Where duty calls for danger, we never want to Jesus, I do pray that you would give each one of us in here the courage to stand up for you, that we would live our life according to the scriptures, Lord, we would obey you and trust you to take care of, every, take care of everything else. Lord, we love you this morning, and each day, Lord, I do pray that you would speak to each heart in this place today. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the night. There's a reason why our hope remains eternal. Jesus is alive. Praise the King. He is risen. Praise the King. He's alive.
death, where is your sting? The world could not ignore it when all the saints are roaring. Hell, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The grief could not
Lord, here we are. We just sang, here I am, take me. Lord, here we are. I pray that you would have your way with us this morning. Change us into the, the people you want us to be. Lord, make us more like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You all can be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So last week on the 10th of November, the Marine Corps celebrated its 246th birthday. Happy birthday to all you Marines. Yeah. And then the next day, there was a national holiday, Veterans Day. So thank you to all of you who have served in the armed forces of the United States of America. Today is... I like it when Veterans Day like falls on the Sunday or the Monday and it's, it feels much more organic to do a Veterans Day message, but I'm going to do a metri- Veterans Day message here like three days late, kind of. So um, I'm going to be in Isaiah chapter 6. You just sang it, actually. So it was gratitude that prompted this old man to visit an old broken pier in eastern, on the eastern seacoast of Florida every Friday night. Until he died in 1973, he would return walking slowly and slightly stooped with a large bucket filled with shrimp. Seagulls would, would, would flock to this old man and he would feed them from his bucket. Many years before, in October 1942, Captain Eddie Rickenbacker was on a mission in his B-17 bomber to deliver an important message to General Douglas MacArthur, who was in New Guinea at the time. But there was an unexpected detour which would throw Captain Eddie into the most harrowing adventure of his life. Somewhere over the South Pacific, the Flying Fortress, which was the nickname for the B-17, was beyond radio reach. 
and fuel had run dangerously low, so the men ditched their plane in the ocean for nearly a month. Captain Eddie and his companions would fight the water, the weather, and the scorching sun. They spent sleepless nights recoiling at giant sharks as giant sharks rammed their rafts. The largest of their life raft was nine by five. The biggest shark was 10 feet long. But of all their enemies at sea, one proved most formidable starvation. Eight days out, the rations were long gone or destroyed by salt water. And it would take a miracle to sustain these guys. In Captain Eddie's own words, quote, Cherry, that was the B-17 pilot, Captain William Cherry, read the service that afternoon and we finished with a prayer for deliverance and a hymn of praise. There was some talk, but it tapered off in the oppressive heat. With my hat pulled down over my eyes to keep out some of the glare, I dozed off. Now, this is still Captain Rickenbacker talking here, quoting him. Something landed on my head, and I knew that it was the seagull. I don't know how I knew. I, I just knew. Everyone else knew, too. No one said a word. But peering out from under my hat brim without moving my head, I could see the expression on their faces. They were staring at the gull. The gull meant food, if I could catch it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Captain Eddie caught the gull. Its flesh was eaten. Its intestines were used for bait to catch fish. And the survivors were sustained and their hopes renewed because of one lone seagull, uncharacteristically hundreds of miles from land, offered itself as a sacrifice. You know Captain Eddie made it, right? And now you also know that he never forgot because every Friday evening about sunset on a lonely stretch along the eastern seaboard of Florida, you'd see an old man walking, white-haired, bushy-eyebrowed, slightly bent, his bucket full of shrimp, and he was there to feed the gulls, to remember the one on a day in 1942 that gave itself up without a struggle, like manna in the wilderness. Amen? Veterans Day was originally Armistice Day. The date, November 11th, celebrates the day we signed a treaty that ended World War I, the the 11th day, the 11th hour, the 11th, or 11th hour, the 11th day, the 11th month. And it's right and proper that, remember, that we remember our war dead, which we do specifically on Memorial Day, and we remember those who served who did not die, and even those who are currently serving, those who paid the ultimate price, paying with their lives, and those who paid a price of sacrificing time from their families, those who have chosen to serve. Now, if we look back through the corridors of time, we think of the sacrifices made at places like Valley Forge, where many died of starvation. Or in the Civil War, where, where many God-fearing people on both sides of the conflict died. In World War I, which was called the war to end all wars, men died from both gunfire and dogfights and mustard gas in a war that had riders on horseback and tanks and a few airplanes all on the battlefield at the same time. World War II, which was incredible in its scope of destruction and the loss of life all the way from Normandy to Midway to the Philippines, then the Korean conflict, Vietnam War, Iraq War, Afghanistan, you know, war seems to be inev inevitable. And it will continue to occur until the upcoming millennial reign of Christ. Amen? The Bible says that you will have wars and rumors of wars, and that has proven to be true. And for every one of them, there must be soldiers. There must be those who enlist. There must be those who say, here I am. Send me. 
These conflicts and many of the others of our great country have been involved in have cost families much grief, much despair, but they have secured and continue to secure our freedom that we seem to be trying to give away ourselves right now. This past Thursday, we waved flags, said prayers in honor of our veterans. We did that in honor and in memoriam. You know, God, he's good with that memorial stuff. He's got a whole chapter on it, actually. If we go to uh, chapter 11 in, in the book of Hebrews, it's often called God's Hall of Fame. And includes a bunch of people uh, that you probably heard of if you've read the Bible. Guys with names like Abel. You know how long Cain hated his brother? As long as he was Abel. <laughs> and there's Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Moses and Rahab and David and more. And in just like any conflict, there are also those who, who just aren't named, but are mentioned by the means by which they suffered and died. In Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verses 36 through 38, we get a list of people. We don't know who they are in this list. We just know how they died. It says, verse 36, still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonments. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. History tells us that one of them, and particularly Isaiah, Justin Martyr identified him as the one who was sawn asunder. Actually, history tells us that he wasn't just simply cut in two. It actually says that he was stuffed inside a hollow log, and then that log was sawn in two. That is how the Isaiah the prophet died. So in Isaiah chapter 6 is where I'll be preaching out of this morning. And if you've read the first five chapters of Isaiah, you see that God is not just a little bit upset with Israel, he is very angry with Israel. In Isaiah chapter 5, you can see from the imagery that, that God had given Israel every possible benefit that they might do his work and follow his will, but instead... Instead of bearing the fine grapes and following him and being a witness to the rest of the known world, the masses of the world about God's goodness, instead they turned to idol worship. And they turned to materialism. And they turned to self-indulgence. And God is not slack in keeping his promises. Though he is long-suffering, he deals with his own in a harsh and a chastening way. Verse 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, this is a human king. I made the point in my teaching on Wednesday night out of 1 Corinthians 15 that we fail sometimes as Christians to miss the historical accuracy of the Bible. And this very first verse, in the year that King Uzziah died, should tell you that this isn't a myth, this isn't a legend, this is a fact of history. Uzziah had been king for 52 years. And for the most part, actually, he'd been a good king. But as it happens sometimes with people that are godly, they begin to think they, they can do things their own way. And at the end of his life, King Uzziah had taken it upon himself to become a priest. And God afflicted him with leprosy. And he didn't die on a throne. He died in a deathbed because of his disobedience. Now, the southern kingdom, Judah, where Uzziah was king, looked as if it was fine. It seemed to be prospering because of the good leadership of Uzziah prior to his years of disobedience. But the people had forgotten God in their hearts and instead depended on the man on the throne. Did you hear that? They had forgotten God and were depending on the man on the human throne. And when Uzziah died, Isaiah, along with the nation, felt lost. You know, I know a bunch of churches that have prospered under some charismatic pastor only to flop when the pastor went to a bigger, better church, right? Attendance in that church drops along with the spiritual teaching that occurred there. That's why it is so important for a church 
not to depend solely on his pastor. I'm here in leadership to lead the flock, but God has given us other men in this congregation that if something happened to me, the church would continue to thrive, the church would continue to survive, the church would continue to grow. We are blessed to have those kind of men in our church. Amen? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train, or the train of his robe, filled the temple. So we're gone from a man on the throne, Uzziah, to a true king on the throne, the Lord. I love it here, if you read through the Hebrew here, for, the word for the Lord here is not Yahweh, which is often used in the Old Testament. The, Lord, the word here is Adonai. And there are three different things that we can learn from just this text. Are you with me? First, God is in charge. Amen? He is on the throne. Where's God? On the throne. A, a continual theme that runs throughout uh, all of this chapter, in fact, and through the whole Bible, is that God is not a small, manageable God, but he is indeed in charge of things and of all creation. He is on the throne. I've talked about it in the past. What we want to do, what mankind wants to do, is to create a more manageable God. One that, well, one that's really not God at all when we're done. People want to put God in a box and, and, and limit him. For instance, they, they want to take him out of creation and take away his supernatural powers, or, or they want to ignore what the Bible teaches about morality or about sexuality and throw out certain parts of the Bible they don't like until they got a God that fits them just fine. Listen, God is in charge, and we have to mold ourselves to conform to him. God is in charge, not you or not some king on a throne or some pastor in a church. God is in charge. Second, he's high and lifted up. Now that shows us dignity and, and majesty that, that's afforded a, a, a king. Here this refers to his being elevated above every created thing. It also shows God as being the center of attention. Regardless of whether you or me are obedient to him, God is still in charge. Newsflash, you can affect the fact that God is in charge. Amen? So now we have this temple, that's where he is. Now we have a temple that was made with human hands, and that temple was simply a copy of the throne room of heaven. That's why when the original tabernacle was built in the wilderness by Moses and the nation of Israel, it was built to certain specifications laid down by God, ones that God required because he wanted to be worshipped in this particular way, and he wanted to be approached in this particular way, it had to be done God's way, because God is in charge. And the third thing, this is only on the second verse, the train of his robe filled the temple. How many of you remember Prince Diana's wedding? Do you remember how long that train was? See, part of the garment that, that a king wore is, is, is the train. And in Eastern society, the bigger the train, the more grand and honored the king. Well, this train of this robe fills the entire temple. So what we see here is a picture of God on the throne, in charge, and no matter what situation you and I face in life, God is in charge. And not only does he have a handle on any situation we face, but he already has whatever we face figured out for us. Amen? So we've seen the king on the, the human king on the throne. We've seen the Lord high and lifted up, seated on his throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple. Now I want you to see the servants, verse 2. Above it. Are you with me? This is such rich scripture here. Above it stood seraphim. One, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. Now the word seraphim comes from the, the root Hebrew word, which means burning. So these seraphim are, are burning ones. And it's really not clear why these angels are actually called seraphim. If you go through the commentaries, you find a couple suggestions. One line of thought is that they were burning in their zeal for the Lord. I'm good with that. Or maybe they were burning because they moved quickly, or, 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 or perhaps they had a, a bright, shining appearance. That's the one I like the best. See, I like that. They're called seraphim because they're bright and shining. Because when angels appear elsewhere in Scripture, they're described as bright and shining. But you can take any one of those three and you're on solid ground. So I'll let you know when I get there on the actual one. 
Seraphim, they're cool angels because they're servant angels. Opposed to cherubim, who are angels that are the guardians of God's holiness. So this text speaks, actually it says seraphim in plural, but it doesn't tell us how many. We know there's more than one, but there could be a thousand or a hundred, we don't know. It's just plural, more than one. And it really doesn't tell us how many there were. Uh, and then six wings. Two covered their face. Even in the perfect, sinless state of an angel, there is a sense of reverence and awe that the seraphim display at the throne of God. They are in the very presence of Adonai. And they cover their eyes because of God's great holiness. And then two, it says, covered their, their feet. Now, one of the commentators said that the expression was not meant, that didn't mean just like their feet. It actually meant like their whole lower extremities. And the leg, feet and the legs were covered so as not to touch the train of the robe that was filling the temple, showing great reverence and respect and even perhaps unworthiness that they felt in the presence of Adonai. And with two he flew. And this speaks to the service of God. The seraphim were, were quick to respond to God in service to him. The word flew literally translates hovering. So these angels are hovering before the throne, waiting in anticipation for God to say, go there. Burning. Those are the servants in this picture. Now watch the worship. Next verse, verse 3. And one cried to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy. This is called the triple hagion by, by Bible scholars. This is a pattern of repetition of threes. It's common for the Jews of, of old to elevate something. And that's how God often does things in threes. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Mother, Son, solid, liquid, gas, sun, moon, stars. The word here used for holy is the New Testament uh, word hagion or hagios, and it means to be separate or to be set apart from. Of the great masses of people that believe in God but do not have a relationship with him, don't understand that God is not the man upstairs. That's one of the phrases I hate the most. God is not the man upstairs. He is not like us. Isaiah 55, verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice, a God of truth, and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. Or Proverbs 17, verse 15. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. God is instead radically different from us in that there is no sin in him and he is radically repulsed by the sin of the human race think about this if a, if the angels in heaven can't look directly upon god what makes us think that we can i like the way timothy puts it in first timothy 6 16 he says god dwells in light unapproachable god is not respected as he should be these days even in the church isn't it interesting that of the three wing sets that these seraphim have, two are used in worship, two in reverence of God, and only one set is used for service. Isaiah 45, verse 9. Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or shall your handiwork say he has no hands? And then the next phrase, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. The evolutionists hate this. They're trying to take away the fact that the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. 
They want to take the responsibility of God creating the earth in the, in, in the, in the biblical manner and reduce it to some kind of chance, to no, nothing more than the wildest of luck. 57 million pieces of stuff went up in the air and it fell down and formed a perfect F-150. To see God's glory, all you have to do is look at his creation. You explain to me how a woodpecker evolved. Or your eye. Amen? One of my favorite views in the United States, actually in the world, and I've been fortunate enough in my life to travel all across the world, is driving south on the Pacific Coast Highway, Highway 101 in Northern California, in the Redwood National Forest, actually. And there's an area where, when you're headed down that way, where the highway comes out from the trees and you're looking out over the ocean and you can see the ocean for miles and the giant redwoods are on your left and the ocean to your right. And the particular day that we were there, the ocean was covered with fog. And it was like looking at earth from heaven. And I realized then that day as a little boy that the whole earth is filled with the glory of God. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke and the voice shook the huge columns in this vision temple even down to the very foundation. It had been like an earthquake. The smoke that filled the temple reminds us of the cloud that followed the Israelites in the wilderness, the presence of God. And the smoke also reminds us of the smoke from the incense, which we find in the chapter of Revelation, that says is the prayer of the saints. And in this case, perhaps the smoke represents the worship words of the seraphim. And then we have this purification that starts to happen. Verse 5, so I said, woe is me. For I am undone. You know, I've had my shoelaces undone, but I've never been undone. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When a person is confronted with the holiness of God, there's a natural feeling of humility. When we look at the Ten Commandments, we realize just how far we all fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned, and, right? And I believe that unless one is convicted of their sin and is broken by it, that person will never come to salvation. The first part of being saved is realizing you're a sinner and repenting. Isaiah sees the perfect Lord seated on his throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe fills the temple with his glory, and the seraphim are, are saying back and forth, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. And, and his response is, woe is me. The word woe actually is pretty cool. It means to be condemned. It's best translated like this. I am filled with over, overwhelming convictions of my own unworthiness with alarm that I have seen God. I am undone. That's cut off. I've sinned. The Greek translation in the Septuagint says, I am miserable, I am pierced through. If you were to look at the Syriac translation, it goes this way, I'm struck dumb. Well, that just described me. I struck dumb. Hebrews, the Hebrew meaning to be destroyed is to be destroyed, to be ruined, to perish. I will be ruined or destroyed. Woe is me, I am undone. That's like the bottom. He says, when I'm a man of unclean lips, foul mouth, unworthy to lift up praise to a holy God, to do so would be a great insult to God. Isaiah, the prophet, saw himself as unfit. This deep consciousness of our deserved guilt because of our sin compared to God's holiness. How did he get to that spot? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Paul said the same thing, Romans 7, verse 24, O wretched man that I am, right? Verse 6, and one of the seraphim flew to me, 
having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Verse 8, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then I said, here am I, send me. And then here comes the marching orders. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return to be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant and the houses are without a man and the land is utterly desolate. And then the Lord has removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it, a remnant. A tenth will be in it, and it will return and be for consuming as a terebinth tree or as an oak, whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed shall be its stump. So what I want you to see in that process as I get close to the end of this message was that the call to go who who will go for us. Then he said, here I am, send me. Then came the orders on what he was to do. The call, acceptance, orders. Sometimes we want orders, let me evaluate. Right? Lord, I'll be a missionary, but first tell me where you want me to go. (laughs) Then I'll make my final decision. In the military... A person goes through basic training, and then you get your orders. And that's where you go. There's really no conversation. Listen, I'm almost done. When God calls you to duty, it's God who determines where, when, and how you go. We just sang the alabaster jar. And the second chorus said, all I have left to give you is my time. You gave your life for me. I live my life for you. That is our call. Are we doing it? Here's the key point so Luke and Rachel can come on up. God calls us to serve him and to serve others, not just stand with our hands out in expectation. We should pattern or be a pattern of the love of Jesus Christ who gave his life as an atonement for sin. God is God regardless of what people think of him. And God is not small nor manageable. God should be given the respect and honor due him. Only God is holy, holy, holy. And the worship of God through the study of his word, through music, even how we live, should predominate over acts of service. Everything should be done to the glory of God. And when we're exposed to the holiness and majesty of God, we should feel incredibly blessed to be in God's family as we really do not deserve it. And when we're called to God's service, we have to respond, no matter what it is or where it is, God wants us to go. Amen? So I've asked Luke and Rachel to bring us an invitation song. It's a song of commitment. And you can take this time to pray or stand and sing along with them. But it is a call of commitment. Take my life and lead me, Lord. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days let them flow in ceaseless praise let them flow in ceaseless praise 
Father, we together recognize the call. Who shall we send? Who will go for us? And together we proclaim, here am I. Send me. In Jesus' name and all the people of God said, amen. You can be seated. Just a few announcements before we close. Men, normal schedule tomorrow night. Uh, normal schedule Wednesday. Uh, everything's kind of going on. We do have, uh, today is the deadline for the Thanksgiving boxes. Uh, I think Gloria is around and she, it, if you need to talk to her about them. The youth got some like lattes and stuff going on in the, the hallway there. Uh, help yourselves. Um, we do need volunteers for the Christmas festival. Uh, sign up is in the, uh, the hallway. We, uh, we're looking for a, a Joseph and Mary I don't know who that might be, but for our, our live nativity. That, are there any other announcements that need to be made? Oh, I'm sorry. And it's exciting. It's so exciting. Our business meetings tonight at 530. That starts at 530. We're going to start at 530. You need to be here on time. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> what about birthdays? Are there any birthdays? Olivia, your birthday? Oh, you have an announcement. I'm sorry.
And you have some examples out here? Great. Excellent. Birthdays. Gene, your birthday. Excellent. Then, Gene, this is just for you. All together now. Okay, to end service today, I'm going to ask you all to stand as together we read Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse 8. Thank you very much. All together, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. Go with God, everyone. Have a great day.